It's hard to believe that it's been three years, but if you follow along with us, it was 2019 in the spring that we kicked off this project that we call Project 17. For those of you guys that watched it, you understand. If you don't understand, we took 17 acres of tillable property and converted it all to wildlife habitat. And it consisted of a center mainframe shape of hardwood tree plantings. We've got about 2,500 or so oaks, got different uh, species of oaks planted in here, surrounded by warm season grasses, separated by fire breaks of uh, clover in between the tree plantings, around the outside edge of the tree plantings, between that and the warm season grass stand, and additionally, uh, clover breaks between the warm season grasses and the timber. And then in some strategic uh, cove areas here, we have uh, about four to five acres of three through three different food plots that I've done on rotation. So um, we're back here today to really kind of show you three years in what things have developed into. And it's a, kind of an ugly time of the year right now. Everything's kind of dead and dull, but the habitat that's standing here is exactly what it should look like for this time of year. And I've got some things that we've learned along the way that we'd like to share with you today. This prospect of being able to grow hardwood, oaks, uh, seedlings, which are notoriously very slow growers in an open field with a semi-moderate deer density was um, admittedly uh, a gamble. And I really didn't feel like I could afford to tree tube, you know, nearly 3,000 trees. So my concept was to overwhelm the deer with food. And that was sort of the decision in deciding to use clover between the, the rows of trees, along with the food plots in the corners that, that hopefully that I could overwhelm the deer with so many food options that they wouldn't have to rely on the buds of these trees. Now, they did, they still ate my trees. Um, and and at, at, a, at a certain point during that first season, I was begin, be, beginning to get really concerned um, that I might lose a majority of them. Then something happened that I didn't expect. And we had an inundation of volunteer sycamore saplings from just a couple of these parent trees around the perimeter on the north side of this field that very successfully planted sycamores in and amongst our oak trees across the entire field. It's as if Somebody came along here and just sprinkled sycamore seeds in and around our oaks. Now, at first I thought, good, they'll ha help act as a cover crop. Immediately after that became concerned because they are such a rapid growing tree that I felt like that I was going to lose my oaks because they were going to shade out uh, and, and cut off the, the sunlight to the trees. That, again, much slower growing oak species compared to these fast growing trees. Time got away from us. As Zach and I came out here a couple different times with the intention of chainsaws or uh, a metal cutting blade on weed eaters and, and just going down through here and carefully taking care of them. But we turned our back on it for three months, it seemed like. And the next thing you know, these things were anywhere from four feet tall. We've got trees out here that end up being 10 and 12 feet tall and more. And these rows are 10 feet apart that this summer it was really concerning because they, they canopied over and I've got a video of uh, me trying to drive down through here with a tractor and at a certain point you felt like well that it's gotten away from me and I've maybe lost this whole thing because I didn't get on mechanically removing them in time. So our idea was that we, we took the, a sprayer on our tractor and uh, Zach drove between the rows and I, I was up on top of the canopy and, and applied a herbicide from the top down and just misted it on top. And, and the idea was that we would, the, the, this was thick enough that it wouldn't allow the chemical to reach the oaks down below, yet it would give an adequate coverage on top. And thank God it worked. And I think we kind of timed it correctly that, um, well, number one, these are stone dead. You can crack them over, everything's dry and, and dried down, but we saw them turn yellow, brown, leaves fell off. And then that revealed all the oaks that were still in here, viable and growing. Um, so it replaced that doubt immediately with some relief that I did catch this in time before it got away. But almost accidentally, we created what I feel is a series of natural shelters. 
because if you look down in here, this is a very small example of probably a chinka pin oak here, but I've got some photographs of after the sycamores were dead that there were nice little flush oaks all up and down through here that still had full canopies of leaves on them. Admittedly, they were much smaller. But I think what we've done now is created some natural barriers, almost a dead fence of trees around these oaks. These guys are dead, no longer gonna restrict the sunlight to my oaks, but this isn't as easy as free choice as they were before when they were out here growing on their own for a deer to come in and nip the buds off. So maybe by just total happenstance, we lucked out and, and this is gonna work out for our young oaks to continue to thrive. But that was a scenario that I did not expect was the sycamore uh, competition that we received from just one or two trees and how successfully they covered this entire field. Now I'd like to walk you guys over here and we'll take a look at the, uh, the nave of warm season grass plantings that we did. This past summer was the third growing season on the warm season grass stand and as you can see it's done exceptionally well. I've taken some photographs and some videos of the progression of this stuff from year one last year and then this year. Year one, matter of fact, I've got a, a good sequence of photos with you between year one and year two, and it's like waist high to you out there standing in the exact same spot. Year three, it's about shoulder height, or two rather, it's shoulder height. And here we are, some of these seed heads are, gosh, eight, nine, 10 feet tall. Um, we have noticed that it's very dominated by switch versus it's hard to find a big blue stem or Indian grass out here. And we are planning on doing a prescribed burn here um, sometime late March, early April on this entire thing and um, kind of monitoring how the response is post burn, whether or not this, the composition of the species might change a little bit, whether or not we get a little more reemergence of the, the big blue stem in India. And they're in here. We saw them when they were, when they were in the process of growing. It's just that when everything got really tall, um, you, this is pretty much all you see is the switch. But what a job it's done. I mean, it's, it's amazing. It's just hard to believe that this is only three years old. Cover, cover, cover for days. Look at this. You'd have a hard time even believing that this was a full-blown bean field with lots and lots of pods on it. But um, this was all just overseeded with the hand seeder. And I think I walked, if I remember right, I counted like every ninth or so row uh, just to make sure I was getting an even distribution and it came in exceptionally well but uh, we've watched this field just re reduce in overall size they've just continued to consume it down evenly across the board over the last couple months here but there's still when you get down in here and look there's a lot of food left um, some of these cereal grains are just laid over but there you can see the consumption off the top all the brassicas are are the greens are being consumed they're pulling the bulbs out of the ground now austrian winter peas in here has gotten a lot of use but and beans too and some pods right? yeah yeah there's still pods you can find them but there's not much of a framework of beans left anymore it almost disappears in here now but there have been as many as 20 and 30 deer in this little field at night um, in addition to what's up on the top field this has been a lot of fun to hunt. From that, from that blind, you can really observe some really cool deer behavior. Been a lot of enjoyable evening spent there. And this is where Bully made his last mistake, right here.